they work with the West, and all of them are agreed that BRICS is not anti-American or anti-West. A lot of people in the strategic community are saying it's an anti-West. It's not. It, the Indian Prime Minister said it's non-West. Others have said it is just, you know, we the, the West is also part of multipolarity if they agree to giving up on unipolarity. Uh, you know, you don't have a world without the West. We would like to be with the West, but we don't believe in the same kind of hierarchy that the West believes in. And we don't have the same universalism. Each of these countries have their own, their civil, they call them civilizational state, which means they have their own philosophies. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I'm talking again to a fellow academic from India, Professor Anuradha Chenoy, who is a specialist of international affairs and has worked for decades, especially on Russia, human security, arms trade, and peace building. Today, we want to discuss a piece of hers, an article that will come out on the 30th of November, entitled The BRICS Plan for a New Financial Architecture, in which Anu discusses like how the how the BRICS economic system will or might be set up from based on her research. Anu, welcome back to the channel. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. Thank you for having me. I'm deeply honored. Well, very glad to talk to you again because so this piece is not out yet, but uh, by the time this talk will come out, it will be quite close, I suppose. Uh, it will come out in uh, Economic and Political Weekly. I will put the link uh, to that in the description as soon as it is out. But can you tell us from your research, what have you managed to find out about the uh, about the setup of this uh, financial architecture that BRICS is now working on? Well, look, uh, first, this financial architecture is not something new, but has got a big push at the Kazan, the 16th meeting of the BRICS. So um, when uh, the BRICS was put into place itself in 2009, the intent was uh, one for a multipolar world, of course, uh, because they felt that uh, this was an irreversible and they wanted to keep constructing it. All the BRICS members are committed to this multipolarity. But they felt that the real basis for multipolarity would be uh, financial systems which would be different than the prevailing ones. Remember that one of the demands and one of the reasons that BRICS came up as a grouping itself was that these five countries were in the lead amongst uh, the countries of the, you know, outside the West that were asking for more voice in the Bretton Woods systems, which they had been denied. So the IMF, World Bank, WTO, they're kind of stacked against um, uh, the uh, countries, especially of the global South. And India and South Africa, Brazil, were continuously saying, we need more voting rights. You know, the, um, the um, Americans have the greatest amount of uh, power in uh, the World Bank and IMF. And, and they didn't find the terms in the IMF and World Bank uh, very suitable because they kept getting into debt. So they did plan this and gradually, finally, in by 2014, they started the New Development Bank. Uh, an Indian professional banker and economist, uh, K.V. Kamath, was the first head of this bank. And all the BRICS month, uh, countries uh, were, became shareholders. Uh, and first they had put in about $50 billion and now then it rose to $100 billion. Uh, and uh, this bank from the very beginning was quite different in that it's, it's not a complete alternate. It's within the global capitalist economic system, but it functions in a different way. Now, how is it different than the World Bank? Number, uh, the second point that I want to make is that along with the making of this bank and the conceptualization of an alternate financial structure, these countries started 
tra bilateral trading in their local national currencies. And that has picked up very fast. Uh, the reason for this is one, that earlier the dominant form of trade was through dollars. So whoever wanted to buy oil, especially because of petrodollars, uh, what the, the U.S. signed with the Saudis in 1974, etc., that um, you know that all oil would be sold only in dollars. So they moved out of the gold standard and they moved into uh, into these petrodollars, which that means every transaction benefits a U.S. bank because it goes through that, and we end up paying doubly once to buy and once to reconvert into, into let's say, rupees or yuan or, or whatever. Uh, so uh, they started this bilateral trading and this experience was there from India's side because during the Soviet Union period, India's Soviet Union had the rupee-ruble trade already for many years, but that ended with the collapse of the Soviet Union. You know, we, we couldn't find a, a, a good medium and we were back to dollars. So this again started around the early two, 2000s and picked up. And the BRICS encouraged this. The bank has encouraged this. Now, the other way the bank is different is that, you know, when you take a loan from the World Bank or IMF, there are certain conditionalities. And that is of structural adjustment policies that you privatize. There's austerity. They, they push countries to... Um, you know, have more taxes, decrease social sector spending. This bank has no conditionalities in that sense. Their conditionalities are that they, the projects that they, they fund uh, or give loans for should be, should broadly coincide with the sustainable development goals. So they should be sustainable. They should be environmentally friendly because a lot of the loans they've given are for green technologies. And third, that they should have, they, you know, they should support socially inclusive and gender goals. So their conditionalities are not that, you know, you change your economic structure, you privatize, et cetera. So that they don't have these conditionalities, which suit the country of the globe the least developed. Uh, the other way is that um, these are um, kind of the, the projects are um, kind of uh, pushed by the countries which want them. So if they are not imposed, so they are organic. And 30% of the projects are uh, in the cur local currency in national currencies again. So again, they kind of semi bypass the dollar, but of course that means 60% are still in the dollar. So it's not that there's some massive de-dollarization going on. It's just that they're, they're, these, this bank believes in a diversity, in a plurality, and that multiple paths of development are possible and everyone doesn't have to go the World Bank IMF way. So their argument, the argument of Dilma Rousseff, who's now the head of the bank, uh, this rotates the directorship of the, the presidency of the bank. She keeps saying that this is this complements other uh, development banks, other financial institutions. It's not meant to replace them. And that is the general trend, that this is a, a supplement, a, it complements, and it is not about de-dollarization. It is a, about encouraging and strengthening uh, national goals, national currencies. And it's very much about sovereignty. So in a sense, the BRICS Bank is not that much a, a part of the new financial architecture as it is an alternative route for uh, infrastructure development in countries, right? It's And it's, it's one of several possible lenders in order to to give cash to realize certain projects and and um in which sense though 
does this bank then now integrate into the plans that are being formulated or that have come out, especially of the Kazan meeting um, in, in, in Russia uh, in, in October a month ago? Uh, because there are there are plans for, for uh, new ways for trading and for increasing the use of national currencies and also for a clearing system. And I think that India and Russia actually have now a uh, started to recognize or started to have a system in order to use credit cards uh, for end users and consumers, right? So that Indian credit cards can be accepted in in Russia, and Russian term uh, Russian terminals can process those, and Indian terminals can process Russia's Mir card. Um, it, this is a, kind of a separate stream from this um, like development of infrastructure, isn't it? Um, Pascal, you know, number one, this is what is planned as a new financial architecture. So it is very much part of this new financial architecture because it does not conform to the dominant architecture of the Bretton Woods. Uh, so it's because it's so different mm. uh, because it's not in dollar and euro. Uh, it is in the national currencies. It is... Um, uh, uh, it and, and the terms, as I just said, are quite different. The terms of lending, the terms of um, return, the terms of debt, etc. Uh, so they and interest low, uh, rates are quite uh, low, uh, like they are in the IMF. But nonetheless, uh, so that way it's different. As far as this clearing system is concerned, that is a second very major part of this financial architecture which you talked about and it's now going to be called uh, bricks clear that's the name uh, and it will be something it will be outside the swift which a lot of countries use which is uh, uh, the us and european the europeans have another system also uh, the chinese have something called the sips the russians also have an internal clearing system but this clearing system is you know, there is a working group which is trying to set it up, which could be used between the BRICS members. So, um, in, because, you know, this has been hastened also because of all the sanctions being used. And that is really hastening this whole process because the countries outside the West are really tired of the sanctions. Russia sanctioned, China is being sanctioned, just Last week, 19 Indian companies were sanctioned because they said they were uh, supplying some goods to uh, Russia, which might help their military. And they, so they're opposed to sanctions and therefore this clearing system, and it hasn't come up completely. There are bilateral methods uh, where the central banks of, um, let's say, Russia and India, the Reserve Bank, are working, as you mentioned. And the system system they have at the moment is called Vostro, where the Vostro system, where the Russians are, you know, you or any other country which wants to trade in national currencies, and it's there with between India and ASEAN countries also, by the way, and UAE, they set up a Vostro account in some specific given bank sanctioned by the Reserve Bank of India. And through those banks, they can trade then in local currencies. So that is already operational and it's saving India a lot of foreign exchange um, reserves as it is these countries. And more and more countries now are opting for this. Now Africa has a pan, it has developing a pan-African messaging system. And China and India and Russia are help. I mean, you know, because they have so many meetings, like before the Kazan conference, there were 400 meetings. So in that, they get these ideas of how to, and this is also linked to the digital currency. So they believe, and there is a digital register, the DLT, um, which the ledger, which um, tracks these currencies. So all these are processes, they're not complete, they're being built, and they will be built because there's enthusiasm about it. And 
uh, there is a fatigue of how they have been treated and excluded uh, from Western institutions. The this frustration and this tiredness of sanctions is a very clear motivator. But isn't there also like an element of of uh, uh, great motivation and kind of kind of uh, um, you know a positive look towards what can be done with these technologies? Because this is going to be the first time that global infrastructure in finance is going to be going to be designed and built by the global south. I mean, we've just never had that. That's like that's 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 very motivating, isn't it? Of the of the possibilities, not just in order not to to rely on the West, but also of the creativity that you can put into such systems and try out try out new things. Um, what, what do you hear at home in India about this process? Well, look, you're right. There's a lot of support and enthusiasm about this and no amount of pressure because that pressure is coming from the West. You know, India also wants, likes to have strategic alliances with the West, with the US, they have good relations with the Europeans, with the Australians, but no amount of pressure is going to hold this process back because it is of economic interest. India has gained a lot because of this oil trading, for example, during the Ukraine conflict, because they have been able to import uh, Russian oil, they um, eluded the sanctions, and they sell that oil to Europe. Uh, they process it and they process the crude and sell it. So they want to continue all that. It has benefited them a lot. And in fact, the beneficiaries of that war, of the civil war in, in, in Europe, are China, India, and other countries of the global south. Because they've got better terms. They've got closer uh, to Russia and, and China. You've seen that recently there has been... Uh, the India-China conflict has seen some opening there, you know, uh, so all all this is um, being viewed very positively. Viewed very positively out is the next meeting in Brazil, because there's a lot of pressure on Brazil. Though Lula is very close to uh, the president, uh, President Putin. But nonetheless, uh, he has to stay in power. So he'll have to do a lot of strategic and economic balancing with the United States. So he does not have the same enthusiasm. You know, this Kazan meeting with these 400 sub meetings at every level. So the relationship between the BRICS has gone to many levels. There are meetings, not just youth and women, and but bankers. And there's an investment platform which has been put into place. Uh, but because of sanctions, it's still being held back and they're being very cautious. Uh, but the gradual institutionalization in BRICS is only in the financial uh, side, not in the security side. They don't want any military alliance, no strategic alliance uh, with each other. They own, they, all of them have their very distinct strategic interests. For example, Russia is not at peace with the West. The Chinese are very anti-hegemonic. In fact, Xi Jinping uh, just a little while ago said unilateral, uh, unipolarity and unilateralism is unilateral um, bullying. But India uh, says you know, they work with the West and all of them are agreed that BRICS is not anti-American or anti-West. A lot of people in the strategic community are saying it's an anti-West. It's not. It, the Indian Prime Minister said it's non-West. Others have said it is just, you know, we the, the West is also part of multipolarity if they agree to giving up on unipolarity. Uh, you know, you don't have a world without the West. We would like to be with the West, but we don't believe in the same kind of hierarchy that the West believes in. And we don't have the same universalism. Each of these countries have their own, their civil, they call them civilizational state, which means they have their own philosophies, you know, so <clears throat> which are yeah. different. 
the, the, the West has a very hard time of comprehending that because for the longest time, globalization meant Westernization and it meant the adoption of Western standards and Western moral, philosophical and standards and language. I mean, the fact that we too converse in English has nothing to do with the beauty of the English language and everything with the people who used who used that language and then imposed it on the rest, although it's different for a Swiss than it is from an Indian, of course. Um, but the this is new that you now have this empowerment of doing something different. And the the, the financial sector is very interesting because it would this would have been possible before. This would have been possible in the 2000s, wouldn't it? It would have been possible in the 2010s, but it took until the 2020s for now the the inertia to have to be overcome and the the global south trying to erect alternatives, not something opposed, but just an alternative. And um, when do you think um, will major parts of this new financial system be developed to a point where you could say, okay, SWIFT is not a, a must anymore, and the uh, IMF and the World Bank are just one of many. Are we already there? Or is there obviously still some things to that really need to be resolved until we can say now we have a multipolar financial system? Well, number one, you're right. Uh, so far for almost 500 years, it was such a Eurocentric world. Uh, everything was from the European and, of course, the Western prism and paradigm and the epistemology. And I'm not saying we're not beneficiaries of that. We are uh, great beneficiaries, uh, but there was it was double-edged. There was the benefit of language, culture, ideas, education, but there was also colonialism and neocolonialism and extraction and uh, the attempt to uh, tie the uh, economic systems of the global south to that of, of the west. For example, if you see Niger and, and France, even today, uh, they provide 70% um, of uh, the lithium, which electro gives electricity to uh, France, but Niger themselves have 70% no electricity. So, you know, they gain the language and they still use the, the franc, but they've got tied with that system, which they see as exploitative. Now, India and other, some of the major, like the, these emerging countries, they emerged out of it and globalization actually benefited them because manufacturing transferred from the West to the East, especially to China and also to India, Vietnam, et cetera. And this process has continued. And that is why now you have a surge where uh, the West is giving up on globalization and wants protectionism and tariffs, et cetera, which is opposed now, obviously, by uh, all the BRICS countries. Uh, that's one. Uh, but the system of this financial architecture, so you see, there's also, you've seen that if you see the statistics of uh, the BRICS countries, if you put them together, their peak, the BRICS countries, Purchasing power parity is now more than that of the G7 countries. Uh, so this does, of course, purchasing power parity is just one metric. It's not the entire. So, of course, you know, the U.S. is still that $37 trillion economy. But then the Chinese are $13 trillion. The Indians are between 3 and $4 trillion. So coming together, so their argument is, that they are now contributing a great deal to the global economy and they should have, have a greater say in it, which they're still being denied. And therefore they're developing these financial structures which are proving beneficial. They're not complete. And in the Kazan meeting, there was a lot of intent to even reform what has gone on so far, for example, uh, the CRA or the reserve arrangement, which is like the IMF, that hasn't worked as much as the new development bank. So they're looking to reform it. 
uh, with an intent that's for bailing out countries if when they are in debt, uh, and and it does also have certain amount of reserves. So they want to reform it. So it's a process, and you can see how new it is, Pascal. The IMF came up in 1914, World Bank 1949, and this is just 2014. So it's just about 10 years and they're battling against huge hegemonic economic structures and trillions of dollars. So this is very minute and there's already pressure that this won't work and there's a negativity about it from many mainstream economists. And they kind of... Uh, uh, while Trump has said that if any country tries to do de-dollarization, de uh, he would sanction it to bits. So there is that pressure. Uh, but nonetheless, it's a process. And I believe to some extent it's also irreversible because it's voluntary. There's no force on it. It's not like you're joining uh, IMF and you can't leave it because you're so indebted. You can leave it any time. Um, it's uh, the, the 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 BRICS clear, which is a financial messaging system, which is being put in place and tried out, uh, is uh, is is not is not started really functioning. This card that you talked about, it's more the Vostro Bank, and Russia has got a huge amount of Indian rupees uh, because they've sold all this oil, etc. Whereas India has not matched. Uh, to getting this, exporting the same amount to Russia because they're quite dependent on Russia still on both defense equipment and oil. But they're working out a system whereby you will see in the next few years the Russians being able to invest in the Indian, in Indian infrastructure. So they'll use that rupee for investments here and, and other places. So this is what they're setting up. This MIR card that you spoke about, it hasn't come into play yet. Uh, it's an experiment, but because of sanctions, uh, it's still a problem. India doesn't want to be have these, um, you know, these secondary sanctions because they start using the MIR. Uh, yeah. So there, there are a lot of issues uh, and roadblocks because of sanctions and uh, and other things. Um, you know, w one of the things that that I'm always concerned about is like how certain fundamental issues will be approached or solved. And, you know, the the U.S. dollar as a global reserve currency, of course, gives the U.S. a lot and a lot of benefits. We understand that. But on the other hand, the 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 reason why that system worked for so long is because there are certain really nice benefits for the using states as well and one very big one is of course that with us dollars you can buy stuff from the us market but you can also buy stuff from other markets right you can use it as a global currency in order to buy uh, in order for switzerland to buy oil from the saudis for the swiss to buy uh, vodka from the Russians, at least until 2022, in order to buy uh, tea from India, you know, all of that, people would accept it. And so your foreign reserves, uh, the, the reserves in US dollars you have as a country is like multi-purpose. But the system we're moving to now creates that problem that the Russians sell oil, that that gives that, that the Indians sell to them in rupees, and what do you do with the rupees? Um, and you do that with every country and suddenly you have all of these different reserves and you either you use them in that country or they kind of just idle around and you need to find investment mechanisms. Do you think that BRICS is working on a way for this also to be resolved so that these reserves also can be somehow exchanged, that you have a currency swap without without then impacting the 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 rate between them, which then devaluates one or the other currency, which would be another problem. So um, how do you see that currency issue um, being a, a tackled? Number one, you're completely right. Uh, this convertibility of the dollar is completely useful and there's no replacement of it yet. Uh, so, and that is used by banks and individuals and no other currency has the same kind of convertibility. So overall, the currency in use globally is still 80% of it is a dollar and then maybe 16% of 
euro and the yen and, and then finally uh, the renminbi uh, china is trying for this convertibility it hasn't really succeeded in that as much as they would like but all these there is this, uh, the way they um, the currencies are valued is through this basket of currencies uh, where the value is set and that is very much part of the global system you know it's the exchange value of let's say the rupee is still to the dollar or the euro uh, and how much uh, it's rated at uh, but what they believe how this issue can be resolved is through uh, this digital currency uh, which would be set but it hasn't been fully worked out yet uh, they still think it's going to take another couple of years uh, but meanwhile it's easier to have this exchange bilaterally so you can see for example how the yuan is being used instead of the petrodollars with between saudi arabia uae and china or iran and china oil trade uae and india oil trade so it's more in trade as opposed to the other now recently what the new development bank the ndb has done is they've started issuing bonds green bonds because the financial system is not just trade it's investments it's bonds it's treasury bonds all kinds of things and here it's just trade at the moment in national currencies so the new step is these bonds which are being issued they're going to issue bonds they had already issued bonds in the real in the brazilian currency in the south african and now they're issuing bonds in the rupees i just read that uh, and i'm going to look at it more carefully um in the next uh, i think um they said september october that they're issuing these bonds and anyone globally can buy these bonds in rupees and they in, they'll get the interest or they can sell it so that's another step the investment setup is another step so very gradually they're moving into the entire financial architecture it will take a lot of time maybe at least 4 5 years but it's definitely on the cards uh, and there are a lot of working groups within um, working it and many new countries are joining the banks for example bangladesh has joined the bank and now the new development bank has regional branches so there is a branch in south africa in brazil and a branch in ahmedabad in gujarat in india so they've opened branches in these countries also and the fact that 13 new countries have joined as partners to the original 5 and then 9 means that all of them would like to become shareholders of the bank and of these systems and be part of them and therefore the the common fund will will increase um, as a consequence and and do you think the bank will also the new development bank will further move into issuing ious so i mean bonds are a form of that it it's not quite a currency but it's a tradable good right that that can where the bank then serves as the trusted Uh, issuer and uh, hopefully a safe investment, right? That's something that a lot of uh, places are looking for. Uh, putting their money into into a safe investment that's then also tradable again on the markets. Do you think that will increase? Will we see more IOUs issued by either this bank or new financial institutions by the BRICS? I think so because uh, they wouldn't have, you know, it started with one country's bond. and now you've seen three or four countries and so <clears throat> it is increasing but as i said you know these are all very new steps but they so far they worked and they've given confidence to these countries currencies and to their economic systems and uh, the next president of the world uh, of the new development bank is going to be a russian uh, dilma rousseff was very effective um and so was uh, vk kamat um the the indian banker uh, so um i mean i think everyone's quite positive about the way it's actually moving 
Yeah, I'm I'm, ha I'm happy to hear that because that's um, th that's going to be a, a substantial backbone of the uh, of the new system. Because, like you know, we talk a lot about the the Bretton Woods institutions and the Bretton Woods system, but in a sense, the original Bretton Woods system, the way it was imagined in 1944, never came to existence. Then came something that was that was pegged to the to gold or pegged the dollar to gold and then came something that survived and the institution survived but the 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 underlying mechanics depended basically 100% on the on the US and to a lesser extent the US European uh, financial and and and, and um a, fis a fiscal and financial cooperation that's also why the, the G7 was such an important grouping because together they could take all of these financial decisions, which um, which complemented the, the 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 approaches of their institutions, the IMF and the World Bank. And as we go forward now, do you think that the the BRICS institutions or the BRICS system will will uh, develop genuinely new approaches to global finance? and investment opportunities and exchange opportunities or are they building now the just alternatives to what there is or is there something genuine new coming well whatever you know its methodology is already quite new and different uh, as we discussed and their intent also is to put pressure on the Bretton Woods to reform so that is also a possibility because the Bretton Woods has also become quite uh, bureaucratic. It takes almost three years for a country to get a loan. Uh, From and the then, World uh, Bank or the IMF. The World Bank and IMF. And uh, then countries are more and more indebted. The same countries, you know, they reschedule their uh, loans. They're unable to pay back. They're more seriously in debt uh, and they fall into a debt trap. Uh, because of the kind and also because of the kind of conditionalities. Uh, and then there are regime changes because, you know, how much austerity can these uh, countries bear uh, withdraw from social sector funding? So that's not there in the new development bank and the contingency reserve arrangement uh, of the BRICS uh, structure. Uh, and as they get more popular, then perhaps the World Bank and IMF might also change their terms of conditionalities uh, because their terms of, of austerity, um, you know, and now they're linked also to climate, et cetera, which um, the BRICS actually rejects. They don't want those kind of conditionalities. They don't feel, they feel um, uh, that uh, the Western countries are the ones who have gained. They they need now that the countries of the global south are some of many of them are actually rising. <clears throat> they need their own financial systems, uh, and uh, therefore um, they would continue to strengthen this. This does not mean that they're going to leave the IMF or World Bank. They will still be part of it. They're going to still rely on the dollars. In India, for instance, and in Brazil and in South Africa, the dollar is very important uh, for the rest of its trade and investment, et cetera, and their reserves. They make sure they have a lot of dollar reserves, treasury bonds, et cetera, just like China also does. Yeah. And the be. Russians did. You know, after all, they put in $300 uh, billion dollars into uh, as their strategic reserve into, into Brussels. So all of them do see the importance of the dollars, but the, they feel the reverse is not true, that the dollar has now been weaponized where you it can be confiscated, the, your gold might be confiscated. So there's that uncertainty. And therefore, to hedge that, it's a kind of an economic hedging that and a strategic hedging that you have these uh, new uh, financial systems and architecture, which is developing and the new development bank is very central to it these are all very good insights anu um i will definitely link to your article once it is out um if people want to follow you um where's the best platform to find your writing they'll actually have i don't use social media very much 
but I write a lot in the Economic and Political Weekly, which is a, a kind of a major. And if anyone wants an article, <clears throat> they can just uh, email me. You can put my um, uh, put my email. Uh, that's chinoy at gmail dot com. If someone really wants any of these. Uh, Okay, I, I will definitely link to uh, to to that and and give your uh, put your email address there as well. Sorry, sorry, you're just freezing up there for a second, but now you're back. Um, now now you're good again. Uh, Anu Chenoy, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, thank you, Pascal. Thank you.